This disgusting Commodore PC arrived in the cave last year. It was found in a disused warehouse, open to the elements, and I'd hoped to restore it, but the damage was a lot worse than I'd anticipated. A rotten system board with broken, pitted, and corroded traces all over. Just look at that horrible thing. But I wasn't put off that easily. Cosmetically, I was able to clean it up and restore the case. We got this thing looking like new, even if there was no computer to speak of inside it. And I promised you that I would find a way to bring it back to life. Well, how long have you been waiting for me to make good on that promise? A whole year. So it really is time to get this done, but I haven't been sitting on my hands, as you'll see a lot of work has gone into this. Today, we are creating a brand new Commodore PC to go inside it and breathe life into it once again. Hello cave dwellers, yes, strap in because we are replicating a 1980s PC. We are going to create a new system board from scratch and we're gonna do it with the help of some friends along the way who you'll meet, some very talented friends who are all coming together with the same belief in preservation, in restoration, and in my case here, in sharing the experience of these old PCs in a museum setting. But beyond that, the work that's done today is gonna to help other people to restore their own Commodore PCs and we can keep them all going in future. It's a really great preservation effort by people with shared passions and uh, shared goals. We're gonna meet them all along the way. If you haven't already watched part one of this series, which was a year ago, it's taken a long time to get here, um, the link's in the video description, go and check it out. And that's where we get it cosmetically looking incredible, going from this horrible pigeon feces covered computer into something you might actually want to touch, even dare I say it, eat your dinner off of. It's a great looking machine. So I want to make it as good on the inside as it is out today. And that all starts with that question, just how exactly do you create a brand new 1980s PC? How indeed? Well, step one, desolder everything from the broken board and save any custom chips that can't be easily replaced. Now Richard and Holly took care of that before handing me the completely depopulated board to make the totally not suspicious at all drop to Rob, who is one of the board folk. Here's our board put in a scanner. You can see it there with none of the components on. It's a two layer board, front and back. So what you see is what you get on this board. You don't need to grind down any layers to see the traces below, thankfully. It makes it a little bit easier to do. And that's the basis for our recreation. So Ian and Chrissy set off using the KiCad software to draw up the schematics. No schematics seem to exist for my board. I've got a revision six PC20 board. There are some available for revision 5.7, so they started out with those, and then they were able to um, update it, just like Commodore would have done, using the uh, revision six updates that they could see on my board and on the scan. And then they went one step further. They incorporated all of the factory fitted patch wires that were on my board to create a whole new iteration. The perfect Commodore PC20 board, if you like. It's painstaking work, which took place over a period of months in their free time. A single error could have caused a lot of pain further down the line, so it was slow and it was meticulous work by the team to get this right. And unbelievably, they did get it right first time. With their schematics, our scan then comes into play again. The schematics are laid out over the scan of the system board to create our new PCB. All of the traces, all of the wires, everything else that you need to turn a schematic into a physical PCB is mapped out with the help of our scan at this stage. And there it is all zoomed out and ready to go. Look at that, that's amazing. That design then goes off to our friends at PCBWay.com who kindly sponsored this project. And they quickly turned our dreams into a reality. PCBWay.com can also help with other services for our project and yours, including CNC milling, 3D printing, and of course, PCB production, even on a small scale. We produced, in this example, 10 boards for our first run to test this out. So we thank PCBWay.com for their help in getting this board into the hands of Chrissy. Now, I didn't just post Chrissy the boards that arrived, I also posted in the box of components that we desoldered, the video chip, the crystals, just the rare items that might have been difficult to get hold of. I also ordered an entire bomb or bill of materials for the rest of the board. So 99% of what you see Chrissy soldering on here 
is brand new components, brand new capacitors, brand new resistors. It's as close to a brand new 80s PC as we can make it. And over the week, Chrissy slowly but surely soldered the whole thing together. Here we see Chrissy soldering on that Paradise video chip. That would have been a tricky one to find a replacement for, and hopefully it is working. Also onto the board go new sockets, new ISA slots, new ports, isn't it glorious? It just, it's a brand new board. It's a brand new board with a few extras also added to the silk screen, including there's the board folks logo and the names of the people that worked on it. And just next to that, there's a little thank you to Holly and I. Where RAM and other chips may be prone to failure in future, we've got sockets on there where previously they would have been soldered to the board. That makes future maintenance and repairs nice and easy. And there you can see as we look across the board, we've labeled ours Revision 6C. Of course, that never existed. That incorporates the extra patch wires and things that we've put on there. I wonder if Commodore might like us to send them the schematics for this. Who would that even be these days, I wonder? Months of work, as you can imagine there, condensed down into about three minutes. It's ridiculous. It really doesn't give a sense of the scale of effort that's gone into this project. Uh, so I will put lots of links down in the video description where you can find out more about what the board folk are doing, the other boards that they've produced, such as the A500++. Do you remember? Years back now, I made the world's newest Amiga. It was an Amiga 500 using a brand new system board and bill of materials, but the brand new board that they had produced and they've done so much more since then. So go and check out the board folk using the link in the description. Now, I want to test this now, but that means I need some accessories and it means I need a monitor. So let's check that out. First up the monitor, I sourced this Commodore 1402 with the help of my friend Billock. Thank you Billock, this is a monochrome monitor. It's from the period a, a little bit earlier than this actual PC20, but it's Commodore branded, which is lovely, and it's pretty dirty on the outside with some sticker residue to deal with. On keyboard duty, it needs to be an XT keyboard to be compatible, and I didn't have a Commodore one, but I've got this as a stopgap, and I'll explain what I mean by that later. This is an original IBM Model F keyboard. Would have been used with the IBM 5150 and the 5160, the original IBM PC back in 1981. This is the keyboard that would have come with it. It was found during a recent arcade raid by those arcade types. They're a different breed to us, those arcadey people, because they picked up this keyboard and went, nah, that's rubbish, and flung it in the bin. Now, thankfully, Holly was there on that day helping to collect some items with Alex. And uh, she took it out of the bin and said, you, you can't throw this out. Yeah, it's rubbish, we don't want that. Okay, I'll take that to Neil. Uh, and thank goodness she did, because it is a piece of history. Who on earth throws away a Model F keyboard? We'll come back to that in a moment. We're back on the monitor here, which threw up a surprise because I was expecting it to be as dirty on the inside as it was on the outside. And look inside here, it's immaculate. It's almost as if it's never been outside of the box and there's no signs of bulging or leaking caps, but there's barely even any dust in there. It's incredible. So I decided to just close it back up. We'll leave that as is and we will give it a scrub on the outside. Sticker residue was dealt with using a little bit of WD-40. Every time I use WD-40 on stickers, you say to me, no, get some goo gone, get some this, that, or the other. You always recommend, um, sound like good products to me and products that I do want to try out. But just as soon as my WD-40 runs out, because it does get the job done, it does seem to remove sticker residue nicely. So that's why I'm using it here again today. Go easy on me in the comments. I will try all of those products that you uh, that you recommend. What else do you recommend? Lighter fluid, brake fluid, all sorts you recommend. Anyway, the WD-40 works for me. The rest of the cleaning was down to antibacterial spray and uh, window cleaner to give this a good clean up. And look at this on the front here. It's still got its protective tape on the badge. How nice is that? If 
finally, a fingertip clean to get into the final nooks and crannies and clean this all up. It's looking really nice. I hope it works. And uh, I put a new plug on it just for safety there. This monitor is now ready for testing. Now, the reason I said that IBM keyboard is a stopgap is not because it isn't a lovely keyboard, but it's because I do want to pair this up eventually with a Commodore branded keyboard. I've got the monitor, got the case. I want it all to be Commodore. I want it all to match. Um, I have found one, but it was in the US and uh, delivery time was four to five weeks. So I don't know that it's going to arrive before this video is out. If it does, I'll show you at the end of the video. Uh, if not, I'll update you later. But for now, this is what we've got to work with, this IBM keyboard, and it deserves a cleanup anyway. Uh, further down the line, when I've got the Commodore keyboard, I would definitely pair this up with an IBM PC. And if anyone's got any pointers out there, any 5150s that are, are for sale in the UK that they might be able to point me to, uh, I'd certainly be interested in that. Preferably, be, preferably one without a keyboard, because I've got that, so I can save a bit of money now on the keyboard. Um, leave me a comment if you see one there. Uh, anyway, let's put the system board back in the case. Let's check out the monitor and then we'll get to that keyboard in just a moment. So let's get that done now. We'll open up the PC and we will slot the system board back in there. Needs a little bit of persuasion to just hook back onto its plastic standoffs, but there it goes. And then I was able to screw it into place. It's a nice, easy system to work in. There's our floppy and hard drive shelf going back into place there and then our power supply can also go on that shelf, which we did test, I'm pretty sure, in the first episode, but I checked it again and it's still putting out the right voltages, so that's safe to use. And then one sticking point could be the fact that this PC uses XTA rather than an IDE hard disk interface, meaning modern replacement is a little bit trickier to find, so I've got something to help us with that. This is what's called an XTCF Lite ISA card. It's an 8-bit ISA card. It would even work with that original IBM 5150 uh, suited to all of these really old PCs. And it will boot from the compact flash card that goes in there as an ID interface. That card will be accessible from the rear of the PC, making it nice and easy to slot out. But I will need to make a 3D print or just cut a bracket um, for longer term use just to secure that in place. But it's fine for testing today without that. So in that goes. And then we can see if it powers up for the very first time. That's the monitor on. And then I can flick the PC on there. And it's quite promising. It's making all the right noises in that the fans are coming on, the lights are coming on, and the PC is making noises as if it's trying to boot the disk drives chuntering. It makes a beep, but there's no video output at this stage. Now, interestingly, this PC also has a composite video output on the back. So I grabbed just a regular domestic TV with a composite input and plugged that in. And this time we can see that it is successfully booting. At first it reports that no hard disk is found, but that's okay, as that's because our card hasn't kicked in yet. And when the card does kick in, we are booting into MS-DOS because I've already got it on the card. You don't need to see me installing MS-DOS, but I had an image I put it on the card and there it is, brilliant. Boots into MS-DOS and we're at our C prompt. Then I grabbed our still filthy keyboard and I plugged that in and it worked. Of course it did, it's an IBM Model F keyboard. It's the equivalent of a Sherman tank. Nothing is gonna stop that thing from working and it works perfectly. And the monitor issue, thankfully, all it was was some dip switches on the back where you can choose whether it's a 40 or 80 column color monitor or if it's a TTL monochrome monitor. So um, I just set it to the monochrome setting and it came to life like this. I then wanted to check out the floppy drive. So I formatted a disk and uh, that worked fine. Created a folder on it, copied some files back and forth it all works great. And I dare say that's the first time that floppy disk drive has ever been used because although this PC was covered in gunk, um, it was new old stock. It was just forgotten about new old stock that got completely destroyed. Our 
On mouse duty, I decided to test it with an Amiga Tank mouse. No, I haven't gone mad. This PC unusually has a D9 port for the mouse and with the DOS driver loaded, it worked perfectly. Feels a little bit odd using what I consider to be an Amiga mouse on a PC, but it actually is just a Commodore mouse. And uh, why shouldn't they use it on the PC? So there you go, tank mice on PCs, whatever next. So how am I gonna use this PC in the cave? That was my next question. And yes, I did find a monitor to test the CGA graphics. I flipped those dip switches again, and we had CGA graphics on the color monitor. And I played on it for as long as my eyes would allow. I'm not really a big fan of that whole magenta era. It's not a powerful PC by any stretch of the imagination. It runs at about four megahertz, well, the original speed of the IBM 5150, around four megahertz, just over. You can, using soft key combination on the keyboard, you can actually double the speed or you can put it into turbo mode. So you can go to around seven or around nine megahertz. It's very Commodore. There's no turbo button on the case. You just do a key combo in it and it beeps at you to tell you what mode it's in. So um, about nine megahertz top speed. The 640K of RAM, yes, it supports CGA. Yes, we've got a, a huge hard drive in there now using our compact flash card, so we could store anything we want on there. But that monochrome monitor just sang to me. And perhaps it's when I paired it up with the IBM PC, uh, the Model F keyboard, that I thought, well, you can see what I thought by the games on the desk here. I thought Infocom Text Adventures. Let's dedicate this to Text Adventures. So next up, we need to scrub that keyboard and we can see how we get on with that as its intended purpose. Yeah, let's stop this keyboard from being a health hazard. So the gloves are on. Should have done this a lot sooner if I'm honest, but I was hoping that that Commodore uh, keyboard would arrive and it hasn't. So let's strip it back and see what state it's in. It only took two screws to open this up. This is by far one of the easiest keyboards I've had to deal with in the past. It's a mechanical keyboard. It uses a buckling spring over a capacitive PCB and it's held in high regard um, in certain circles. The later Model M keyboard, I'm told, uses a membrane instead and uh, the, the purists like the F over the M, but I'm sure there'll be plenty to, to fight both corners on the keyboard front. There was some protective foam on the back of the PCB in the board, which had just turned to dust. So I removed that and I set about cleaning the keyboard. I think it's about time we just had a nice musical montage while I clean. We haven't done that for a while, so let's hit the music. How good does that look? I think that's incredible. No maintenance was needed, no, no physical maintenance was needed really other than a cleanup because it is in perfect working order. 
And to think it nearly ended up in landfill. Well done to Holly for spotting that just in time. And um, while its longer term destiny isn't with the Commodore PC, it will eventually be paired up with that IBM PC when I get hold of one. And I think a lot of people are gonna enjoy using this keyboard. I already am, it's wonderful. And with the keyboard done, this corner of the cave becomes a celebration of the work that has gone into this PC. I put another replica board on the wall there, mounted that with some information uh, about the backstory behind this whole restoration project so that people can enjoy that, as well as a lamp over here. Of course, I need a lamp if it's text adventures, a nod to the, uh, the whole um, genre. And there it is on the desk there. If that doesn't make you want to sit down and play text adventures, I don't know what would. Maybe just a cup of coffee there as well to go with it. This recent Infocom donation to the cave is the perfect companion. Although I might not put leather goddesses on here in case of younger players come into the cave, but I will put Hitchhiker's Guide. That is an absolute must when we're talking text adventures as well as Zork that can go on there too. So uh, I didn't install them as such because you can run them off the floppy disk or you just copy all of the files off of the floppy disk onto the, onto the um, hard drive to run it here. So I did that. And I also knocked up a quick batch file to display a menu of text adventures installed on here when it boots up and make it nice and easy for people to run programs. And my goodness, just listen to that keyboard in action. The monitor, I think, is wonderful for this purpose, not least because of that slow, almost lazy screen refresh, which leaves phosphor glowing on the screen as it updates far longer than any color display that I've got here in the cave. It's so satisfying to see that text just fade away. And a few hours were quickly lost by me playing on these text adventures. But not just me, because the very next day, visitors to the cave were in and, uh, well, they really took to this machine. Lots of people enjoying it. And this of course now is the end game for any restoration that happens here in the cave to share it with others, to see them enjoy it or not enjoy it. But in this case, they really did take to it. They particularly loved the keyboard. There was at least one person who was on here for about 45 minutes of their three hour visit to the cave. So they certainly enjoyed it when there was so much else to choose around them. I wasn't forcing people to sit and play this. They were enjoying it of their own volition. So clearly it's an inviting setup that they wanted to play on and um, play on it they did. It really was a hit. Such a satisfying restoration and I cannot thank enough the board folk. It's a real reflection of what's happening here at the Retro Collective now, at the cave and in the arcade archive as well. People with a common goal all coming together who really want to um, preserve these things, preserve the thing itself, but also the experience of using the thing. We don't want to just put broken computers on a shelf or in a cabinet and say, look at that, it's great. We want to get them working. We want people to use them with the original displays, with the original keyboards, and to um, experience them as they were meant to be experienced. All right, with a few embellishments like a hurricane lamp, you wouldn't necessarily have that in your desk back in the day, but it, it's all to draw, draw you into that one station and make you enjoy it. And um, Saturday when people came and played on it, it, it really did prove that I think text adventures are the right choice for this setup. However, I'm interested to hear your voices down in the comments. Should we make another episode where we upgrade this machine? Or is this where it should sit now? Should we find another PC to represent that CGA, EGA era, 286, 386 era. Because for me personally, I was an 8-bit Amstrad man, 16-bit Amiga man, and then I moved on to PC with the 486. That's where my nostalgia begins for IBM PC compatibles. Not so much with those earlier machines. So I need your guidance on what there is to discover in that era and what type of machine should I use? Should it be this or should I look out for something else? Also, if anyone out there can point me in the direction of an IBM PC 5150, preferably without a keyboard, so I can save some money on that because I've already got the keyboard and I'm already sure this keyboard will outlive me. Um, please let me know because I'd like to get hold of one. And boy, those two side by side, a 5150 and a Commodore PC20, wouldn't that just look glorious? 
I'd have to set up a whole new desk just for that display. Now, just as we came to the very end of this recording, look what arrived. It's the Commodore keyboard. Like the monitor, it's a little bit earlier than the PC-20 itself. It would have been on earlier models of the Commodore PC, but it's Commodore branded, it suits it. And yes, it's not as nice as the IBM model left to type on, but um, we will dedicate that to an IBM when I get hold of one. And that completes the look of the system. I think it looks brilliant. I'm so glad that arrived before this video went out. So there you go, that's the finished machine. Come and see it for yourself. If you head to retrocollective.co.uk, you can see when the cave is open, you can book a ticket and you can come and visit and um, show us your text adventure skills. Is speed running text adventures a thing? It must be, I'm sure it is. How quickly can you play through Zork? Come and show me. <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed this restoration and this series. And uh, if you really enjoy what we're doing here, if you want to support the museum, if you want to support these preservation efforts and the videos themselves, please head to uh, patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro, where you can donate a small amount every month to support our efforts here. Uh, it really is what keeps this channel alive more than anything else. So that support is very much appreciated and very much needed to uh, keep this channel alive. And thank you to everyone who does support us in that way. Until next time, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Take care and bye-bye.